Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited to have Derek Johansson who's the creator and founder of CopyHour.com. And for those of you who don't know, it's the Work Your Ass Off copywriting course that's been featured on Forbes and Early to Rise. He's helped several students go from zero to six figures in under a year. And he's going to talk about how copywriting and specifically his handwriting exercises helped bring his business to the next level. Uh, in his 20s, he was a professional baseball player, basketball player, and rock star. That last part is not true, but it does say it on his website. So I almost, <laughs> those be I almost parts, believed those it. Those last three yes. parts are not true. I almost believed <laughs> it. Um, but Derek, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. This is uh, this will be fun. It will be. And I'm excited to hear big lessons, learn mistakes, what worked, what didn't work on your journey. And I always like to include a fun fact first. And a fun fact about you that most people don't know is you compete with the weirdest athletes in the world. What does that mean? Well, uh, very simply, that means that I am, uh, I guess I would be considered not a professional baseball player or a professional of any sort, but I'm a I'm an amateur cyclist. Okay. So I don't know if you know anything about people that ride bikes. Um, besides, when you're driving in your car and you get angry at them, <laughs> right. especially when there's a big group of them. But uh, I am one of those individuals that rides around spandex and uh, has people yell at me, and it's just it's simultaneously the the weirdest group of people and also very driven group of people. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting group Explain to be around. Explain that for a second. What do you mean by weirdest group of people? What makes them weird? Oh, well, I mean, first of all, it takes kind of a special weird person to be riding around in spandex and then also to be crazy enough to be riding around in traffic because cars do not give a crap about you. People get very upset at bike, you know, people that are on a bike, which is interesting. Um, so, and I don't know, just if getting to talk to people just very focused on their diet and talking about how many watts they can push out and all this other stuff. And they, it's weird because it's a sport where people compare themselves directly to the highest athletes in the world. So you get a guy that has, you know, like a belly, an older man in his 50s talking about how um, he's amazed that some of the biggest cyclists in the world can, that are 20 years old, can go up a hill faster than he can. So it's it's just just odd people, but yeah. So that goes into my, yeah. as I was doing a lot of research on you, you have a site, Live Uncomfortably. I mean, your main site is Copy Hour and, and you probably have other sites, but Live Uncomfortably I was reading and I thought it was really cool. That's your motto for life, right? Definitely, yeah, definitely. So what have you done that's made you most uncomfortable throughout the years? Oh, I mean, definitely starting a business and, and breaking out of a career was very uncomfortable. Um, I've done a lot of stuff with uh, diet and fitness, actually. One of my best friends is someone that I consider to be one of the best people to talk to when it comes to getting in shape fast. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've done a lot of kind of experiments surrounding that stuff. Mm -hmm. What have they I've recommended? Also, what was that? What have they recommended you do? Um, well, his product is now off the market, mm -hmm. but, um, it's basically, uh, he has different various exercises and then like a very strict diet. So I guess the, the uncomfortable element of it is sticking to a crazy diet, uh, or crazy strict, I should say crazy strict diet for, you know, three months, uh, to six months. Mm -hmm. And, um, then also done some other stuff with, um, talking to women, and you know getting out there and putting yourself out there and and trying to attract the ladies so, yeah so how um, do you get over yeah. that uncomfortability when talking to women or because that is probably a big sticking point for for a lot of people yeah well and i wouldn't say that i'm the the ultimate suave pickle <laughs> at all no no uh, you go actually, you I, wear your spandex I, and <laughs> yeah, yes exactly uh go to the club in, in the biking gear <laughs> normally um no, uh, I actually I have a fiance now. I'm I'm gonna congratulations be next year. But um, before that, yeah, I mean, really for me, it was just embracing the embracing this live uncomfortably mindset and and that motto. So if something's gonna make me uncomfortable, it's probably the thing that's gonna make me better. Mm -hmm. So just that having that knowledge and having that thought process makes things a little bit easier, and and you know, it kind of allows you to. Um, to take that fear 
and, and turn it into something positive. Yeah. I ask because the same, obviously, living uncomfortable, if you apply to women or business or whatever, it all applies. So I was just curious your techniques to get over that uncomfortable feeling to actually go up and either start a business or go and talk to a woman. Yeah, it's just it's more along the lines of uh, seeking out the things that make you afraid that aren't mm. going to kill you. you know? So do you have something on your list now that you still have to do? Um, well, you know, it's funny. I, I feel like in a lot of ways I've handled like the three biggest issues and it, like coincidentally, they're the three biggest information publishing, uh, you know, things, which is, uh, you know, diet and fitness and then relationships and then business. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, the, definitely the business stuff is still, is still making me uncomfortable doing interviews like this. This and, makes you uncomfortable. Really? Well, you know, cause you're bit. always and, on and camera. Yeah, yeah. I think of doing, you know, there's always that that twinge of, um, you know, how am I going to be perceived? Yeah. All this other stuff that yeah. that always comes into un, into play. So you know, yeah. getting uncomfortable and, and stuff still stuff yeah. definitely still makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. But, I don't yeah. know why I sound surprised. Like every time I like before I get on, I'm like sort of jittery. Too. Like my stomach is has the butterflies. Like, yeah. You know, I want to make sure this yeah. is a good experience for Derek. So yeah, I could see that for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um. So. I want to get into your story, your big influences growing up, but I want to talk about first, what's one thing the audience can do now to get a quick win, to start getting results, whether it's with their business or copywriting? Yeah. And I think we're going to talk about this more later, mm -hmm. but without... And yeah, without dive saying, into whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah no. Well, what, without selling my product in any way, I think something that people can immediately start doing that's going to impact their business and their marketing is handwriting. Yeah. Uh, for me, it has been probably the single biggest thing that has helped me with figuring out uh, different business models uh, for my consulting and for just my marketing chops in general. Um, there's something about actually taking out a physical pen mm -hmm. and a physical piece of paper and putting words down on the page um, that is is magical and it, uh, it it's helped me it's helped thousands of other people at this point and, and most of the big marketers um, gurus if you want to call them that whatever um, have used this handwriting exercise uh, to get started yes. so that that's the quickest win and you don't have to buy my product you don't have to do anything else but I just say start handwriting so when you say handwriting you just mean get a notebook out and just handwrite whatever you're trying to do, or what do you mean by that? Well, handwrite a sales letter. So okay. if you're, and I assume most of the people on this call are interested in business and you know uh, their marketing chops. Yes. So so take take a classic sales letter. A great place to find classic sales letters uh, is infomarketingblog.com. If you haven't heard of it, and uh, he's got a bunch of older classic ads on there that he talks about. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence is the guy that runs that runs that site. Mm -hmm. So. Take a take a famous sales letter and and copy it by hand. So literally take it. Um, sorry, I'm using this mic here. I'm holding it in my hand. Uh, so uh, take out the sales letter and go through sentence by sentence and recopy it in your own handwriting. And it sounds weird. It sounds stupid. It sounds like this would not do anything. But for whatever reason, if you can fight through and do your first sales letter, yeah. you'll be like, oh wow. This is really interesting. It just gives you, gets the mind firing. It gives you ideas. Um, they, you know, they've shown when there's when people are handwriting, there's actually more brain activity going on uh, than if you're typing or doing anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've run into a sticking point, if you don't, and and even if you don't know what type of business to start, we've had people that have have done this and then <clears throat> found their business model through it. Um, so and then we've had people that have an existing business or helping another business yeah. and they've found that breakthrough marketing idea that they needed. Yeah. No, that's great advice and you know the time and time again with the you know whatever you want to call them legends of copywriting when I ask them their advice a lot of them have said handwrite a sales letter. You know just yeah. just keep handwriting it. I love that mug by the way. Um, so Derek, let's talk about I want to talk about some of the influences you know that you've had growing up. What was a what was a big influence? Where did you grow up and what influenced you? Yeah, uh, I grew up in San Diego, where I am currently, um, and ooh, big influences from childhood. I guess really 
Um, I did. I had very supportive parents, but both of my parents were not entrepreneurial in any way. And I don't know where the seed of wanting to be an entrepreneur first kind of lit. Yeah. Um, but but I think part of it had to do um, with with seeing my parents and seeing how they interacted uh, with their jobs and money. And actually, a story that really sticks out to me. Um, I didn't tell you this before we were talking, but yeah. um, my my dad uh, was working for a, a giant telecommunications company, and they had a policy where if you could figure out an idea um, that would save the company money, they would give you a percentage of all the money that was saved. So it's a my great, dad, it's a great policy. Yeah, it, in theory. So my dad ended up. Uh, doing something that saved the company something like, I don't know, uh, something like $25 million. Holy cow. And they ended up coming back to him and saying, listen, you figured this out basically because of the job that you were working in. So there's no way that we can give you money for this. And that really, he talked about that quite a bit. And and that really stuck with me as as. I have to strike out on my own, A, to create a different company culture, um, and and B, that this is the type of thing that can happen if you're kind of in the, stuck in the employee mindset. So that was, that was definitely, a, you know, and, and I, you know, I don't often think about that, but I'm thinking now that I think that's something that definitely affected me when yeah. I was, when I was younger. So. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, yeah. So maybe we should implement that in our business about uh, actually giving some a percentage of saving money or yeah 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 it's actually a really good idea yeah. so you came up with it Derek so <laughs> well, <laughs> um, so you also had an interesting job like most people at lemonade stands what did you have okay yeah so when when we were growing up in our backyard we had. Um, avocado trees this is my dream by the way i love avocado like if i had an avocado tree that'd be like money gold Uh, yeah yeah and that's what it was uh so we had a ton of them in our backyard uh growing up and it's funny to think now like how in heaven i would be just like you if we had avocado trees but um unfortunately i'm not living in that same area anymore but um so we had a surplus of avocados and uh, one day, my brother and I got the idea to take the avocados down to the corner of a busy street that we live near and set up a, a little avocado stand instead of a lemonade stand. And we were selling avocados at the time. I think it was like, it was either like four or five for a dollar. And uh, back then, that was a fantastic deal. Uh, that's, st- I mean, that's, that's a crazy still a deal. Great deal. Yeah, 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 for sure. So back then, it was even, you know, uh, that, was a, that was a great deal. And we would have people just like peeling out, stopping uh, to like spin around and come back to our stand. And, you know, uh, we got on the local news and oh, really? we, we were, yeah, I think, I think when we went down there, we, I'm probably my, you know, childhood brain is over exaggerating, but we were making like a hundred bucks a day <laughs> doing this. That's great. And um, for whatever reason, uh, you know, we stopped doing it like it just was like oh, I'd rather go ride my bikes with my friends or something but um you yeah, made so it that, enough that you were comfortable and happy yeah yeah um exactly so that was kind of my probably my first experience with entrepreneurship and um but for whatever reason once I graduated from UCLA uh I went directly I I went directly into a job and yeah. I thought that that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life was uh, be an employee. And so, what did yeah. you do after you saw? Like, I, I actually want to ask. So, was there anything early on, like with you and your brother, that you found you did intuitively that worked? Like cars were peeling over to the side of the road. Or was it just like you were in the right? You picked the right location, or just pe- yeah? I think that's a it? huge. I think that's a huge thing that we did, which was. A, we had something that people wanted and we had an incredible deal on it. And B, we didn't go set up on like a country road. We set up on the busiest road that we could find and still be safe setting up. So those, I think those were definitely two things that, you know, two yeah. lessons learned right there. Yeah. So what did you do after school, after UCLA? So after UCLA, I started working for a music publishing company and... Uh, it was a good job. Just um, to back up, because you you majored in something with music, right? 
Or what did you I do in school? No, I majored in communications. Oh, studies. communications. Okay. Yeah. So I got a I got a good intro into marketing, definitely mm-hmm. uh, through that um, mass marketing. I think it was mass communications was the emphasis. Mm-hmm. So um, I thought I wanted to be in in music, and I'd always heard that music publishing was kind of like the safest path, and uh, so that's what I decided to do. And I got a job working with a, a really good company, and. Uh, something, you know, I loved everybody I worked with. It was great. But I started to notice that I didn't want to be my bosses. So I was looking mm-hmm. at my bosses and I was like, all right, these people are 15 to 20 years ahead of me, maybe more. Smart. And yeah. they don't seem very happy. They don't seem like they're enjoying what they're doing necessarily. Um, you know, sometimes they love it. A lot of times they complain about it. And I was like, what I this is who I'm going to end up being. I had kind of that clarity, like this is what I'm going to be like, right? I mean, I can see it. So I decided I had to make a change. At the same time, uh, my friend Clay uh, had told me about uh, the uh, four-hour work week, and that just blew blew the doors open. That just like completely, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. seeing is believing, and, and being able to see that others have done something. I was like oh my God, this is possible. And so we both quit our jobs within, uh, I think it was within about four or five months of reading uh, that book. And both of us have been pretty good about uh, saving. And uh, we were were, uh, roommates in college. And so uh, we saved and, and we moved to Panama. And uh, just- Why Panama? Some are cheap. Well, actually, I was telling Ryan Levesque about this. Uh, the we were reading a uh, a blog at the time by Tynan. I think it's Tynan or Tynan. I always screw it up. Um, he and he had a blog called Life Nomadic, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he was talking about Panama City as being a, a great place to kind of live a nomadic digital lifestyle. So we decided to go there. Found out we didn't like Panama City at all and uh, headed up towards the mountains to this uh, place called Boquete and uh, just kind of holed up in a in a bungalow that we bought it was uh, not bought but uh, rented and it was five hundred dollars a month I think split between the both of us pretty good and yeah yeah, and it was it was pretty nice actually Um, so we just uh, dove into marketing internet marketing affiliate marketing and started to build up my skills and chops so what'd you do first that actually that you saw some traction? Because I'm sure you tried a lot of stuff that didn't work. Yeah, yeah. Well, we saw some traction with affiliate marketing, and uh, that was something that I liked. Uh, and then at at this time we were we were traveling uh, even more. So we started going. We went from South America, uh, or we went from Central America to South America. Then we were back in the states, and then we went to Asia, and um, so we were. I was doing a little bit of affiliate marketing and I decided that I wanted to be the one that affiliates were pushing traffic for. So I started a, uh, it was for James Bond fans, it was called the James Bond Lifestyle or uh, actually that's another product. It was a guy who had a similar product that I didn't even know about at the time, but I wrote a book for James Bond fans uh, called the 007 Lifestyle, I think. Hmm. Um, And I started to see some good traction with that. So I got um, threw up a sales page. It was a it was a PDF book. Um, got some good reviews around it. Started to have some affiliates drive traffic. Was doing my own affiliate marketing on the back end of that, and uh, that was really like the first thing. Um, what kind of people that, bought that type of product? It was mainly older James Bond fans that okay. kind of wanted like a fantasy reality mix um, to to think about, and. Yeah, so that was uh, that brought me to Thailand, and then in Thailand I met a, a group of entrepreneurs that were out there, and um, so from there started a publishing company. It was just, just working with information publishers or information marketers, and that took me back to Philly and got them all over the globe. So wait, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So what did your parents say about this? Like, did they? Do you talk to them? I mean, because if you think about, it, they're not entrepreneurial. They just have. Sounds like nine to five jobs. Is this a big paradigm shift for them? They're like, I'm just going to quit and travel the world. Or yeah, I think in the very beginning, it was like, oh, he's young. Let him do what he wants. You know. <laughs> yeah. um, and my mom has always just been like, 
no, oh, just be happy, do what you want to do. And so um, both my parents were very supportive. Um, but I think they were like, ah, oh, eventually he'll come back and, you know, start a real job and, you know, go from there. So, uh, yeah, they were they were very supportive, though. But that never happened. No, but no real happened. job. Yes. Yeah. 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 So what was uh, the next? What was another big turning point for you? Um, well, I came back to Philly and Philadelphia and started a publishing company uh, with a friend of mine that I had met in Thailand and uh, we had some very early successes uh, we were originally we were selling our publishing model so uh, I got in and developed an entire publishing model uh, where we did together around uh, my book and then the books that he had uh, written at the time and we started to bring on a couple authors and then the wheels kind of came off and long story short I ended up leaving the business and that was uh, just for me it was kind of a, a big failure at the moment I dumped a lot of time and money and energy into it and then I was living in Philly with my now fiance um, who I had met while I was there and that was a you know that was a pretty low point um, and that was I guess the beginning of the turning point for me um, when I took uh, one of our clients uh, was an actor. We have an acting career advice uh, product. So uh, I took him, and then I also do a, uh, started doing a little bit of, of consulting with some other uh, info. You know, just kind of how-to experts. Mm -hmm. um, I started helping those people launch their products. Um, so consulting on that stuff. Yeah, and that was a little bit of the turning point. And coinciding with all of that was uh, getting my first introduction to the handwriting exercise working on my marketing mm -hmm. and uh, starting copy hour so I want to hear I, about that and how you heard about the handwriting exercise but what was working early on with the publishing company you said early on you were getting a lot of you were having a lot of traction and success what was working well he had built up an audience that we were we were able to to turn to in the very beginning and kind of sell our system to um, so that was I guess that would would have been the the early successes with that is when we launched. Um, I remember we did something like twenty five thousand dollars in a couple hours, and uh, that was you know kind of eye opening to me at the time, for yeah. sure. And um, yeah, so that that was kind of the the early portion of that. So how are yeah. you introduced to the the hand handwriting the handwriting exercise? Yeah. Um, that was basically. You know, it's funny as a as somebody that's interested in copywriting, you like you want to have like a really tight story about yourself. And you know, when you're when you're talking to other people, and when I say all these things to you, I'm like, geez, I need to get my story together. Man. This is all over the place. <laughs> well, you but, know what? Like, I keep it very <laughs> conversational, so you're allowed to kind of meander all over. Yeah. But we come back to to how you discovered it and everything. Yeah. So. At this time, um, after the publishing company getting, you know, getting my feet back underneath me, essentially, I started to realize that everything I was doing was related to copywriting. And I started to see copywriting as that one key skill mm -hmm. that, uh, like the, key to, the keystone uh, skill. So you could use this for everything yeah. and it could be a massive key to success in just business yeah. in general. Um, so what made you discover that? I just started to look at everything I'd ever done and and realize that uh, copywriting was always there and understanding the customer and understanding the prospect was one of the biggest elements and focusing on them and not me. And that's a big part of copywriting is is focusing on them and not yourself so that realization just kind of hit me and at the time I had uh, discovered Gary Halbert and uh, you know obviously all the different other copywriters and and was getting really into it and he has a letter called the hands-on experience and it's basically about how to become a great copywriter really fast and how to or how to write your first sales letter really fast so um, I saw that and in it was a mention of handwriting sales letters like I was talking about and kind of started looking around and uh, saw that common theme, uh, Dan Kennedy, John Carlton, a bunch of other people 
uh, talked about handwriting sales letters. I think Bob Bly talks about it, um, and Ted Nicholas and some of these other yeah. bigger guys. So yeah. I was like, huh, that's really interesting. Um, and at the time I was in a forum, uh, entrepreneurial forum, and <clears throat> I was like, Hey, I want to do this handwriting exercise and I need a way to stick with it because it's really hard. And I got about, I think it was like 10 or 15 people the first go around. And one of those guys was actually John McIntyre, um, who's now gone on to do a bunch of other really cool stuff. And then my friend Clay. And so we started uh, doing this handwriting exercise and I would just send people a sales letter and, uh, and then we would kind of check into a forum and some crazy stuff started happening. Like John McIntyre just blew up. I mean, it was insane. I'm not saying it was all copy hour and all this exercise, but you know, he just, he just blew up from there. I started, uh, you know, realizing all the mistakes I was making in my marketing, uh, started changing headlines and saw immediate returns. Yeah. What and, were some of the mistakes that you changed? Um, just just terrible headlines and 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 talking to the the prospect, uh, like thinking the prospect was more aware of me than mm -hmm. than they really were is a, a problem that I ran into time and time again. Calling my my stuff like a revolutionary uh, acting career program when there was nothing else like it on the internet, and uh, so basically. Th those were the biggest mistakes is just approaching a customer in, in the incorrect, you know, in an incorrect way. I asked because uh -huh. I'm sure I'm guilty of it and a lot of people are guilty of it. What was it that you, what were you doing with the, I don't know, specifically with the acting and then what did you end up kind of um, phrasing or, or putting in there to be more like the, or, you know, teach more to the audience? Yeah. So I think... Yeah, in the beginning, <clears throat> what we were doing was was framing, was trying to sell the product um, before we spoke directly to the the actors and and met them where they were, where they think that they need headshots, they think they need an agent, they think they need all these different things. Um, so we were we were trying to uh, trying to sell the product of the acting career revolutionary acting career product mm -hmm. basically is, you know, kind of how it was framed. And at the time there was nothing else like that. Everything, everybody else was selling headshots. Everybody else was selling, uh, get an agent. There was no, there wasn't really anybody else giving acting career advice. Um, so we had a very unusual, different product. And, uh, so we tried to speak directly about that product and people just didn't understand it. They didn't get it. So we were going too direct in the beginning, um, whereas now uh, something that's that's working for us really well is uh, I've got a headline that I use. We do a lot of, we make most of our sales off of webinars direct from Facebook. So Facebook advertising to a webinar signup page. Um, and the, the headline that I'm using now that works is, is case study, how I book 13 network TV roles in under one year. And the the implied promise there is that you can you can do the same obviously um, and it's more uh, David kind of talking about his story and and the uh, unusual different things that he did leading up to that year and and then from there we talk about how all, all that relates to acting the acting career uh, system that we have mm -hmm. so. Um, it was just making small tweaks like that, I would say, is kind of the immediate effects. And then also just seeing the, seeing the, uh, the headline formulas that tend to work. And, you know, now with all of our blog posts and everything else, it's, you know, trying to work around those headlines um, that we know and have seen and seen for years, uh, decades, uh, you know, working. So what did you have? Before, do you remember? Before you changed to case study, how I booked 13 network TV roles in under one year. Because I'm sure that went through a lot of changes. Dude, I don't even remember. <laughs> I can't even remember. I'm just curious. What, point, yeah. How do you get in the, I guess, mindset to write headlines? What is your method? Uh, the mindset to write headlines. All right. So for me, and this might, might vary for different people, uh, 
my my first thing is is I'll go through and I'll I'll handwrite sales letters. Like if I'm if I need to write a piece of copy, I'm gonna I'm gonna handwrite before I do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I can, I try to find something in the same industry with the the actor that I work with. There's nothing else out there that exists, so it's kind of making it up as we go. Um, but uh, so first, what I try to do is is really figure out a you know the customer what, what does he want what's his core desire mm-hmm. and and then figure out his level of awareness with whatever i'm selling mm-hmm. so has he been sold a bunch of similar products before uh, does he know does he is he aware of is he even aware of his own problems uh, does he know what he's doing wrong does he know there's a solution to those problems so so i kind of i kind of start with that and then I also think about what, uh, how he interacts with the medium. So, uh, in the online space, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be different than if if, if it was uh, an infomercial or on TV or something. So, um, I think about our like even in emails. So I try to make my, I try to make my ad look like a piece of content from that industry especially if I'm going especially if I'm going indirect so if you're approaching somebody from a kind of indirect uh, position um, with a story or like a secret or something along those lines uh, I like to make it look like a piece of content first and foremost and then uh, move from there but if you're going direct and you're just selling the program outright, then it can look a little bit more like a sales page or look more salesy. Yeah, I'm so, rambling, but I hope no, that no, makes no. Sense. Yeah. So what has worked well? It sounds like you know doing Facebook as the webinar has worked well. What works when you get people on the webinar? What has worked as far as the when when they're sales? Out. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, our our basic process is we get them on and we tell them mainly it comes down to first we start with and this is i don't know if this is only going to be you know this space related so i don't know how useful this is to to other people but we we start with the mistakes that people are making and and show them examples of of why this doesn't work um and we talk about uh, david's story um as far as you know how he did things differently and how he saw to do things differently and then we talk about the five things that you should be doing. And those five things relate to the five module system that we have. And then we go into the pitch yeah. and, you know, take it from there, go into the offer from there. And then, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it tends to work pretty well. Yeah. No, that is yeah. helpful actually. Yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, people can apply it to any industry. Um, yeah. and you kind of, Look at the story arc, and I remember listening to something that you had said on uh, another video where you love made to stick. You know, talking about stories and how stories are important. So, yeah, that's weaved in there for sure. Yeah, uh, story is definitely weaved in, and, and story and examples. Um, there needs it, for us. There needs to be a lot of examples of other actors that have that have done it because it's such an unusual thing that nobody's heard before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's- so what else, um, what are some other successful campaigns and why they were effective? Yeah, so I mean, I could even talk about the sales letter that's up at Copy Hour. Yeah. So Copy Hour originally, if you go way back, when I first got started, I didn't really need a sales page because it was just among a group of friends. And then I realized, oh, this handwriting thing, there needs to be an accountability program for this handwriting exercise. And that's what Copy Hour is. So if I was to say um, the accountability exercise for the handwriting exercise, people would be like, what the hell is this guy talking about? You know, Not so sexy. Uh, yeah, not so sexy. And unless you'd heard about the handwriting exercise and knew how hard it was to implement on your own, that's not, that's not going to get you excited. So um, I, in the beginning, it was it – was, along those lines of the accountability for handwriting. And, and then it switched to more of learn how to become a, a, a copywriter in eight weeks or learn how to become a world-class copywriter in, in eight weeks. And uh, that worked okay, but what I found really worked was when I, when I flipped it 
a little bit and made it even less direct and made it uh, very indirect with the secret. So, um, you know, uh, Gary Halbert has a, a famous it's secret. It's kind of weird, blah, 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 blah. This is what this is what the secret has done uh, for all these other people. And I have a ton of just kind of testimonial stuff uh, put in there. And and now that sales letter uh, converts much higher than than before. Definitely. So people want to find out what that secret is. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, the the secret stuff. Uh, some people don't like it. Some people don't like calling stuff a secret, especially, Why? dude. I don't know the the copywriting and marketing space. If you can market successfully to people, you're a stud. <laughs> right. Man, right. Just because people are so people skeptical. skeptical. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I kind of try to make the secret angle a little kitschy, and and fun because yeah. you know people kind of get upset if you start talking about secrets. They're like, oh. Yeah, so. What I thought was interesting yeah. with the Titans event when Dan Kennedy was speaking mm -hmm. is it's interesting from a marketing perspective is he's selling, he's telling you what he's doing. Yeah. You know, so you respect that, you know. Yeah. And, and that's what I yeah. that's like that's the best way I've found to sell to to other marketers is just as you're marketing, be telling people why you're marketing. And I've got some stuff on on the copy hour sales page that's like, you know, kind of arrows pointing out the little selling points mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and yes. in emails too talking about it and if i ever make a mistake or somebody points out a grammar issue i'll always like point back to it and be like ah see this is a stealth mind trick right here this is stealth <laughs> copyright <Do it> on <laughs> but yeah i mean people should read that that sales page just as an exercise you know your uh your sales page you know oh, it, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's yeah. great the copy hour um, and so what, in, what were some of the breakthroughs you saw the students had? I know you've had uh, several students who went through it and they've done really well. Yeah, I think so first and foremost, the biggest thing that, that has happened for people is just kind of clarity in their marketing efforts. And it's, it's related to the handwriting exercise. Like I say, uh, if you start doing it, your, your brain starts to work and it starts firing. And, and, and Clay and I actually, Clay has, has helped me with this quite a bit because he's into neuroscience. And mm -hmm. um, basically when, when you're learning something uh, and, and you're trying to copy these words, there becomes a disconnect when you can't necessarily memorize what you're, what you're copying. So if I try to go back and say something word for word or go back or write a sentence and then write it again uh, from memory without looking at it, uh, there's kind of a, a information gap there, a knowledge gap, and that knowledge gap creates learning, uh, helps you learn. So um, something that has really happened for people is, is first and foremost is the clarity, like I was saying. So getting clear um, on what constitutes marketing, uh, good marketing, and it's also slowing down. So you can, you can slow down and you can actually see um, the words that are being written because there's a lot of people that skim through a sales page or sales material and think that they know right. what's going on in that letter, but yes. they don't. And even if you can, even if you type it, you can type so much faster than you can handwrite. So, so slowing down, uh, is, is a huge part of it. Yeah. So, um, and then a lot of people, uh, I've, I've had a lot of actual kind of like beginning entrepreneurs or people that want to get started. They don't really know what to do. And, just sitting down and, and reading the, the various sales letters that I yeah. send gives them an indication of what kind of business models are working, yeah. um, what offers are being presented, and that's a big one. Um, so if I'm going to write an ebook, how should I? What kind of stuff should be in that ebook? And if you sit down and you handwrite a offer, like the offer portion of a sales letter, you're going to see what's in that product and what is, you know, how they're presenting that offer, uh, to the prospect. So, yeah. um, and then now just, just recently, I've just been getting emails from people. I've had uh, a few different copywriters. There was one guy, uh, started handwriting for four hours and four hours a day, plus doing all this other wow. stuff. And he went from, he went from zero to six figures and that was under six months. Wow. And another guy it took him two years, um, and then another one did it in a year as far as taking, and these are mainly copywriters and marketing consultants that have mm -hmm. basically hit that yeah. 
hundred thousand dollar a year billing rate. So yeah. I mean, what do you think is just laziness? I mean, I was reading on your site, which you make a perfect comparison to like pro athletes. They watch the game tape, you know, and then you have this sales letter and it's proven that this sales letter has produced millions of dollars or multi-million dollars. Why do you think what's holding people back from actually doing that handwriting it? It's proven to work. Yeah, I think I don't know. It's like anything else. Um, we are lazy. Yes, it's a difficult, hard thing. It's like learning. Um, you know, it's it's hard to get people to want to learn. I guess um, I would say it's human, and it's human nature. That's I mean, that's the reason that Copy Hour exists is because I know how valuable this handwriting exercise is. And when people actually do it, they see how valuable it is. Mm-hmm. But if you're if you're all alone, sitting in your in your office in your bedroom, whatever else trying to handwrite a sales letter you just are like this is ridiculous like this is you know why why am i doing this i'm a crazy person like literally if you saw the amount of notebooks i have that are just filled with scribble like if i were to die tomorrow hopefully i don't um and there would like the cops came to my house and started digging around they would think i was it'd be like beautiful uh, mind yeah, exactly <laughs> it would just be like this guy is a serial killer um so you know it's it's uh that having having a group setting to do it, even if even if you're not necessarily interacting with that group, but knowing there are other people doing it helps. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, kind of, copy hour is an accountability thing. It's also to try and build the habit because I know that people need to build this habit, or they should, or mm-hmm. you know, should at least try sure. it for a little while. So it's obviously yeah. this stuff has worked, and there's other things that have worked really well. What's some campaigns that didn't work, and why? Um, well, like I was saying, the, with the actor, we've had, we've had some big failures with trying to have ads around like the revolutionary acting career system. Eh, It's just somebody's on Facebook. That doesn't sound right or real. Um, so, so that type of stuff has, has definitely failed. Um, I've had some clients, I worked with a food truck and them installing, you know, a USP for their business that was something along the lines of a uh, a new breed of food truck, which that doesn't say anything. And um, so that kind of stuff I've seen I've seen fail. Um, yeah. Not yeah. focusing on the audience's needs, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I don't yeah. know. You know, it's like it's not necessarily failure um, because there's a lot of ads that I write that fail, but that just helps me find the one that doesn't fail, right. you know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah. So I don't know if it's necessarily failure, it's just kind of learning. Right, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So what are some of your favorite headlines? You mentioned the case study one, what else, what other ones inspire you? Yeah, um, there's actually, probably my favorite one is from Gary Halbert, um, it's called The Amazing Diet Secret of a Desperate Housewife, and that was long before the shows ever came out or anything. Um, but. Uh, yeah, that one really inspires me just because, well, first of all, I don't know how usable amazing is at, in headlines anymore, but because uh, it's just been kind of overdone. But um, at the time there, you know, that would have that would have definitely stopped somebody because this was uh, from a space ad, which is an ad that appears in a newspaper or a magazine or uh, even online. But um, so they would make those ads look like newspaper content. So mm-hmm. somebody scrolling through or flipping through, God, I can't, you know, people actually read newspapers these days, it's crazy. But flipping through a newspaper and you see a headline that looks like a news headline and says the amazing diet secret of a desperate housewife and say, you've tried everything related to dieting and you're also a, a woman or a housewife, you know, that's gonna stop you. Yeah. Um, it's so, interesting how that one is one of your favorites. Yeah, I like it. I, I just like it. I think because there's an implied story and there's an implied big, uh, big promise and big benefit in that one. I, I don't know. There's something about that one that I just I've always loved. Mm-hmm. And um, then one that I don't even like. And <laughs> there's <laughs> there's a lot of people that actually like. Um, you know what? I don't I, I'm this. glad I you're going to talk about this. Because I don't use this formula anymore. I'm glad you're going to talk about this because I should rephrase my question of not which ones you like, but which ones actually worked. You know, and so go yeah. ahead. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this one is uh, for that the James Bond book that I wrote, but it was Who Else Wants to Live Like James Bond? And the who else thing has been way, way overdone. And um, I used it at the time because I had heard from other people, from the gurus or whatever you want to call them, that, that – uh, and I don't say that in a negative light. Like I, lo- I love most of the gurus, but um, they, uh, the, you know, who else, who else wants desired results or whatever um, as the formula? And that one seemed to work, and I tried to beat it, and that was the one. <laughs> that was the one. Why didn't you like it? Just because you thought it was overdone, or? <laughs> yeah, I just thought it was overdone, and I don't know. Yeah. I just, yeah. That, I mean, that's that's really the only reason it didn't strike me as original. But sometimes you don't need to be original, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, Derek, who are some of the you know leaders in the industry or gurus that you like to follow or that you've studied from that have enjoyed the most? Yeah, well, the I mean, Halbert, Gary Halbert is somebody that you got to pay attention to. Um, I like uh, Michael Masterson and uh, Ford. Uh, any of their books are are so good. Um, and a guy that everybody should be paying attention to right now is uh, Chris Haddad. Yeah, and, I interviewed Chris. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, uh, his stuff is incredible, and I mean, just Gary Bensavenga, um, Eugene Schwartz, just the big names. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, you could you could list all of them. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, but Chris recently is what you. Uh... Yeah, I mean, right now I think Chris is probably one of the top the top dudes. So yeah. I would definitely be paying attention to what he does for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and even guys like um, Ramith Sethi, his his work over at I Will Teach You to Be Rich, I think it's fantastic. I think mm-hmm. he's doing a great job over there. Yeah. So yeah. what are the biggest mistakes people make with their copywriting that you see or in their marketing? Because you do a lot of consulting too with businesses. Yeah, I think the the biggest mistake with copy specifically is kind of what I talked about before where not understanding where the – where the prospect is mentally related mm-hmm. to you and to your product and to their problem. Um, I think that's just like the biggest one you run into. People, business owners tend to want to just say directly, um, just want to speak directly to the uh, the prospect saying, this is what I have, this is the offer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess an example of this would be like saying, Hey, I have half price sausages. Um, say you're at like a food truck event and you have a ton of different food trucks there and you're all kind of competing for business and you have a sign that says half price sausages. Well, if nobody knows who you are, nobody knows what your original prices are for your sausages, it's just that's that message is going to be lost on mm-hmm, people. Mm-hmm. So um, I think a lot of that transfers over into the the online space and wherever else you're marketing it's just um not not under like thinking you're a bigger deal than you really are mm-hmm. and and not understanding uh your prospects yeah 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 Derek, i like that one and it's hard to do that though sometimes and like especially let's say you're not an actor and you're writing for like an actor product how do you get in the mindset how do, how do I customer. get mindset? Yeah, like if you're, or if you're consulting with like a food truck owner, how do you get the mindset of their customer? Oh man, it's it's hard work. It's it's basically research. So finding forums that I can I can you know I can just dig through. It's going to Amazon and and looking at the various books in that space, and if I need to, buying those books and reading them. Um, and then also what we do is after somebody signs up for our list, we continue to do this. So somebody lands on our, our webinar landing page, they sign up. The next thing that they get is a survey and surprisingly just, I think it's like 80% of people fill it out, which blows my mind. Um, because these are the type of numbers you can get when you're not working in the fricking marketing space. But, um, so it's like. They uh, fill that out, and I read those things every day. So um, if I need to write something, I can go back, mm-hmm. and I try to. Um, and I've actually been influenced a lot by Ryan Levesque recently with with his survey stuff. Oh, for sure. So I try to go back and and look at, uh, or try to ask questions that I know are going to help me to write copy mm-hmm. later. And, yeah. Uh, you know, so it's it's digging in there and just um, 
you know, yeah, those are good. Get Forums, Amazon, do surveys for for you know yeah. to your customers, and you know Derek's, you can't phone it in. You know, it's like you can't fake that stuff. I don't think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't talk to our customers enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Derek, since this is Inspired Insider, you know, I I have to ask this question, which is, um, what was the lowest point in your life, and then what you thought about to get through that tough time. Well, it was about 45 minutes ago, right before I talked to you. <laughs> Why is no. that? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, lowest point in my life was after the, the publishing uh, company uh, failed or I had to leave the company. That was, that was, a, very, that was a very low period uh, in my life just because from the standpoint of being embarrassed about failing, not wanting to be seen as a failure. Uh, that was that was a kind of a little bit of a dark period, and I was living on the East Coast, uh, removed from my my friends and family, mm-hmm. and and right around that time, also um, my uh, my fiance's father passed away. Oh my god! So all Sorry three of those, wow. yeah, it was it was rough. Um, so all three of those things were you know kind of weighing on my mind um, at that time. So yeah, why did you was, think it was a failure though? If you just it's, was it really a failure if you just decided I'm going to do well, something I, else? I think I perceived it at that time as being a failure, but it, it has helped me, you know, and that's part of uh, part of the process of getting through it is is understanding that it wasn't a failure. It's just you know failing forward, um, and that was definitely something that that helped me helped me move forward with it for sure. You know. Yeah. So then, what got you through that over that? Because we could say, oh yeah. This will just get me to the next level, but inside it still hurts bad. Yeah. What got you kind of your mindset on the right track at that time? Dude, I don't know if you're going to believe this, but handwriting. I'm not even kidding. Like, <laughs> you're like, so I'm like hour deck. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, it, it What did was, you do with handwriting at the time? Well, just that, I mean, that period was around when I found the handwriting exercise really? and um, and then also uh, you know falling back on to my live uncomfortably mindset stuff and I started to I partook immediately in a bunch of challenges um, so doing the uh, doing the workout program that I was I was telling you about that mm-hmm. my friend wrote so that that took I think that was about a three month period um, so just falling back onto the growth uh, falling back onto growth periods that I that I kind of know work for me and know can help me move forward and not focus on the negative and yeah. you know experiment. I don't yeah. know. So there's something about experimentation yeah. that uh, that really helps you move forward. So when you're doing the handwriting, explain this to me. You're doing the handwriting. You're in a your mindset's not in a good place. What what were you thinking at the time? Did it just reverse your thinking, or you know what what happened? Well, I think it gave me uh, a rigid schedule and gave me uh, structure and form and uh, for whatever reason like got my got my mind off of things that you know were not necessarily the best in my life yeah uh, yeah no thanks I appreciate you yeah. sharing that it's, yeah it's tough to talk about those times sometimes yeah. now on the flip side Derek besides starting this interview what's been your proudest accomplishment <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, business related, I would say something that has been really awesome has just been seeing the success of of some of these these copywriters that I've that I was mentioning that 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 blew up and and you know started making their dreams happening uh, like that. I don't know. It, it's it makes everything kind of kind of worthwhile. Yeah, uh, for sure. And then also in my first bike race ever, I got second place. So. Nice. <laughs> That's always good. I always yeah. like this too, Derek. You know, what does your day look like? Daily rituals. You always look at someone, you know, successful entrepreneur. You're like, what do they, what do they do every day? What What's your day look like? Okay, so I am a I am now a Monday through Friday worker, which is interesting. But um, so, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I I'll, I work on the weekends too, but yeah. it, like my days are kind of more regimented on uh, during the week. So basically, wake up um, semi early, 
say 6 30 to 7 i don't know if that's that early for pretty early. yeah well, yeah with zero kids i'd say that's pretty early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably gonna have to be earlier <laughs> in the future so uh do that make my make my morning coffee and then i will read um, it's normally uh, nonfiction, so read some sort of business marketing book and uh, then hop into the handwriting exercise. And then, I mean, and, and actually, I haven't been doing the handwriting exercise all that much recently. But um, so from there. Things are going too good for you. <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. Um, so uh, that's the, the first portion is kind of, uh, you know, waking up, jumping immediately into to reading handwriting if I'm going to do it. Um, then I'll work on normally if I have a copy hour assignment I need to put together, I'll do that in the morning as well. And then from there I'll hop into to um, like kind of client work. So either for myself or for a client, if I have a client at the moment, I will uh, jump into any you know pressing stuff that needs to be done for them. That usually takes me around to noon or one and I'll hop on a bike and then come back home. And from there, it's uh, just kind of whatever other to-do tasks need to be done. And then by that time, uh, my fiance is normally arriving home and, you know, see where the night goes. Do you ever do work in the yeah. evening time? I ask this because, you know, it's a funny thing when I talk to entrepreneurs and like, you know, Jeremy, you need to ask more about, I want to hear more about like the nuts and bolts. Like what does someone do on a daily basis? To you, it sounds boring probably, but for some reason people want to know what is that day break? How does it break down? You know? Yeah. Um, I used to, so I've figured out and I think it's something that people need to experiment with, but I figured out that I need, I need to immediately jump into into like work and I consider reading in the morning as kind of a, a work related thing, mm -hmm. but I'm most productive right in the morning up until around like one. Um, and then at that point I could either take a nap or exercise really. So I like, I decide to exercise and I think it's a huge part of the day and people overlook it. Yeah. And I don't think people get enough sleep either. Um, but yes, for sure. So I, uh, I'll jump into to that. And I used to have just this lull from like three to five or there's like three to six where like I would try to do things, but I could not get them done. So that is for me, that's like either answer email time um, more religiously than, than before because I, you know, I still need to work on my email habits. Uh, not perfect at that at all. But that's kind of, you know, lower level tasks, hopefully in the afternoon. And then I used to get an energy hit around six, hmm. where now I can I can work for a while, a couple a couple more hours, um, but uh, I haven't been exploring that so much recently. But I don't know. I, I think if you can figure that out, that's a that's a, yeah. a major thing. And if you can work around it, I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if people have jobs or or whatever else. But if you can work around that, it's you know, you should try to. Yeah, that's interesting because you know you're on productive times. So you kind of like, okay, this is my designated email time or whatever it is. So yeah. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So Derek, to to wrap it up, tell people about what you're working on now. Let's point them to whatever sites, which should they check out for you? Um, sure. <laughs> well, we've already mentioned it. I have one I last question after this. Too much. But... Yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> so copyhour.com is, is a project that is actually – over the, I've, I've been doing this for like three years now, which is crazy to me to think, but that project is starting to get a little bit more momentum, so I'm devoting more time to it now. So that is um, copyhour.com. Uh, you're basically just going to hit a page and you can self-select as to whether or not you are an entrepreneur or yeah, I like a that. copywriter or consultant. And so from there, then you have a the you know traditional sales letter or whatever else. And... Um, you know, you can go check that out. So that is uh, that's my main project uh, at the moment. And then, like I said, I've been I've been working uh, closely with this this actor for a while. And um, you know, I don't know, man. Like like I said, like as a as somebody interested in copywriting and and marketing, you want to have like this tight story and tight direction about about what you're doing. But yeah. I'm just I'm 
I'm working on copy hour. I'm working with yeah. this actor and just kind of trying to figure out my next moves. Man. Anything right? that you yeah. think like this is the industry I want to break into, I want to get into. I have been very interested in going into the cycling market. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just because it's a passionate group of people that spend a lot of money. So that sounds like a good. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds good. Like good. What, what are we waiting for? Yeah, sounds yeah, good. exactly. Um, yeah, and then also I have been experimenting a little bit with. I basically I've got these guys going through Copy Hour um, that are looking for jobs, looking for. Um, you know, looking for work. Mm -hmm. So I have been toying with the idea of a little copy agency um, for people that have kind of graduated from copy hour. So um, if anybody needs any copy and kind of wants somebody that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, up and coming, young, not going to charge you a lot, um, you but know, just shoot trained. me an email because I'm, I'm still kind of am exploring that, but we'll see, yeah. we'll see where that takes me. No, I like that. So my yeah. last question, Derek, and I really appreciate your time is yeah. what are the top, and I ask this for selfish reasons, what are the, some of your top, maybe top three marketing books or business books that are must? Like I should go to Audible right now and, and download them. All right, so you probably heard all this stuff before, but maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Influence, um, Cialdini, that's yeah. probably the best, even for copywriting, that's one of the best books that you can, yeah. that you can find. And... Then I would say Winning Through Intimidation hmm. by Robert Ringer. That I haven't read that one. Book. Okay. Okay, yeah, I would I would read that. It's it's really I'm not that into really intimidation, but I'm sure it will help me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all about positioning. Okay. So, um, and you know, I always <laughs> you read these books and then afterwards you're like, Am I positioning myself correctly? <laughs> so um, so that one, God. I'm trying to think of something that's just going to blow your mind yes. for the third one. Um, and I'm drawing a blank, of course. What are you reading now? Uh, right now I've been working my it. way through some Masterson books. Okay. Um, Great Leads. Great that's Leads. That's a really John good Ford one to check out. John, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I could leave it with that one. That's okay. a great one. I like that yeah. one. Yeah. Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you very much.